be looking at the, uh, you know, what led up to the Arab uprisings and the kind of ripple effects of the Arab uprisings, specifically from a political perspective, which a lot of us have done, but actually goes far beyond this and has tried to look at the uh, cultural impact, uh, to look at the Gulf and what's been happening there, uh, to look at civil society and activism. Um, some of our uh, Carnegie colleagues, like Nathan Brown, have also been part of this project. Uh, it actually, it's a, it's a wonderful book and a wonderful project that has a lot of friends and a lot of colleagues in it. And I would urge you all to get your copy on your way out uh, and read it because there's a lot to learn uh, from it. I just wanted to say welcome uh, and just that it really gives me great pleasure to be, uh, and gives us at Carnegie great pleasure to be launching this book with Sanasis, with the Century Foundation, um, and with these notes, I hand it over to you. <laughs> thank you so much, Maha. I uh, really appreciate all of you for coming, and thank you to Carnegie for hosting us. Is the, is the sound okay? All right, great. Uh, so it's a, it's a great pleasure uh, for us to, to be together with you here for the launch of Arab Politics uh, Beyond the Uprisings, which is the, the fruit of two years of research. Uh, the, uh, the project was born at, at the moment a couple of years ago when the, uh, the, the, the sort of period of optimism and excitement that had began in 2010 and 2011 had, had hit, hit the wall and there was this, this sort of region-wide uh, despair and sense of, of, of getting stuck again. And the question we began with was, uh, what happens uh, to all that political energy and initiative? Uh, we, know, we know it's there. It's no longer just latent or, 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 or baked into the, the, the subsoil. It is now a, uh, an unleashed uh, force uh, throughout the region. So where does it go? What impact does it have? What spaces uh, does it attempt to fill uh, at that period when traditional politics again began to be foreclosed for revolutionary groups or reformist groups or, or, or other activists. We had uh, also a, uh, a, a very specific type of research that we wanted to promote. So in a, in a period when the whole world was uh, paying attention once again uh, uh, to Arab politics or for many people for the first time, uh, we had a, a, a an initial framing notion, which is that Arab politics are no different than any other politics. So to begin with, the, uh, the sort of constructs that tried to put uh, you know, Arab democracy or Arab politics or Arab activism in a different basket from, from any other, uh, uh, we, we wanted to, to break down that sort of uh, barrier in, in method. We also wanted to promote uh, what we saw as the most important building block of understanding what came before and what might come next, which is uh, uh, qualitative, descriptive history and, and, and uh, eth ethnographic anthropology. So basically, uh, before we try and fit things into a theoretical box or make arguments about why and what, uh, let us actually try and describe what is happening with a real uh, care for the details. Uh, because whether you're looking at the uprising in Egypt or the, the war in Syria and the events that, that, that preceded it turning into a violent conflict, uh, the, the granular details matter. They determine why and what and, and they must precede any, uh, any smart policy uh, discussion of the region. So what we ended up with here is 20 pieces of original research uh, some by academics, some by policy researchers, some by journalists, uh, the overwhelming majority of whom are from the region or based in the region, deeply rooted in the subjects that they're writing about and trying to answer different permutations of this question. Where did politics go and what, uh, what happens uh, to momentum uh, when it is, when it is uh, uh, blocked from going through traditional uh, political challenges? Uh, we're, we're also interested in this question of the effort to, to change power and, and address power. Uh, so uh, that's the, the overall framing of the project. 
the Sundry Foundation is a nearly 100-year-old progressive institution headquartered in New York uh, whose mission is committed to uh, promoting equality and international corporate, uh, cooperation, and our international work is largely focused on uh, U.S. policy in the Middle East and the, the developments in, uh, in the Arab political space. <sighs> Today, we're going to have two panels. Uh, I'm beginning with uh, a panel that looks at, at culture and, uh, and media. And after a short break, we'll have a, a panel that looks at uh, questions of governance uh, and local power uh, in Egypt and Syria. And joining me is Sima Radar, a policy associate at the Century Foundation. Uh, she uh, got her master's degree at LSE and has been working for the last several years on a variety of research projects that look at uh, civil society in the Levant. Uh, and she has written a chapter about the effort in Lebanon to win equal citizenship rights for women, uh, to, to win the right of women to pass nationality uh, to their children, which uh, I think Lebanon might be alone uh, now in the region or one of the few uh, outliers in the, in the region that has refused to uh, uh, modernize its laws. Uh, and uh, all the way to my left, Laura Dean, uh, a journalist who's based in, in, in the region. She lived uh, no longer, but she lived for five years in Egypt uh, and has done a lot, of, a lot of great work chronicling different uh, aspects of, of the attempted transformation in the region. And she's written a really uh, seminal study of the, uh, I was going to call it newspaper, but the, uh, the, the, the activist publication Mada Masr, uh, which has been, uh, has emerged over many years as one of the most important uh, uh, locations of uh, uh, political energy uh, in Egypt. Uh, and uh, my, uh, my work uh, in this project looked at the uh, Beirut Medina, the uh, movement in Beirut and the efforts here uh, to harness uh, citizen, a citizen's revolt against bad garbage services and turn it into something uh, that challenged the status quo. Uh, and I will be referencing a little bit of that research in, in dialogue uh, with, uh, with Seema and, and Laura. Uh, so I'm going to start uh, by asking Laura, tell us a little bit about the story of Mada Masr and, and what role it ended up playing in, uh, in Egyptian politics after, the, after the, uh, the uprising and the sort of awful period that followed. Yeah. Um, so Mada Masr was one, um, is one of the last surviving members of what really was a blossoming of um, political organizations, artists, collective, media outlets uh, following the January uh, 2011 revolution in Egypt. Um, and it was one of many organizations that really served to embody the principles of that revolution, which was bread, freedom, and social justice. So they were very focused on sort of equality writ large. Um, and MADA strove to do that not only in their um, content, in which very much focused on holding power to account and, you know, elevating marginalized voices in Egypt. Um, but also they, they wanted to reflect that in their newsroom culture. So all decisions were made by consensus um, with um, some, with generally successful, but also could be cumbersome at times. Um, and they also, they would do kind of unusual things like publishing newsroom meeting um, meeting minutes on their website, so to give readers kind of a window into what was going on. Um, and even their business model also strove to, effect, to reflect those, um, those ideas. So they tried to move away from an ad-generated revenue stream to, um, they experimented with reader-supported models. Um, they, they, had, they held sort of events like the Madame Market and different things to sort of really bring reporters into it in an, into an interaction with their readers. I think uh, Lina Atala, their 
founder, but also, well, she would say co-founder with many other um, journalists, really saw themselves as in a wider community with, with their readership. Um, and so, um, but in, in the current climate, as Matthew mentioned, since, I mean, they really, they started at a pretty pivotal moment. They launched on June 30th, 2013, uh, which preceded by six days the, um, the ouster of then President um, Mohamed Morsi, and then there has been sort of a crackdown um, that has followed since then. So they really, and so what one of, one of the journalists said to me, she said, you know, we, were, we had all these ideas about um, embodying these, these, our, these principles we had, and in the end there was so much news we were just sort of doing what we thought was kind of trying to do objective, unbiased journalism, but in the news climate at the time, that was a pretty radical thing to be doing. Um, so, but as the sort of international media cycle has somewhat turned away from Egypt, um, and also they were doing this from the beginning, they really started to expand their Arabic side. Um, it's an English, it's, a, it's an English Arabic publication. Um, and, and as they've done that, that has brought them really under greater scrutiny from the state. Um, and also, and especially the, the bringing on of one of Egypt's most prominent human rights defenders, um, Hossein Bahkat, in, as an investigative journalist, and who has, throughout his career, has been really unafraid of tackling things like the military, things like, you know, the Mubarak family and assets and these things that are very taboo um, in Egyptian media has, um, has really brought them in the, into the crosshairs of the state. I mean, uh, Hossein was, has been arrested, he's, not, um, and is subject to a travel ban, and, you know, there have been interrogations, but nevertheless, um, Mudder remains committed to publishing. Um. So this, so this, this publication, which I guess never appeared on paper, right? It was always an online, yes. an online publication, has filled a role that in, at other times was also played by NGOs that issued human rights reports. Uh, it's filled a role that was partially filled at other times in, in recent Egyptian history by television uh, shows and, and other, I mean, there, the, for a while there was like a thriving independent media sphere that was critical of the army, somewhat critical of, of, of the state. And, and, uh, and so Mada is providing all that plus trying to behave as a, as a model for what a revolutionary collective that can make money uh, uh, would do. Um, what does that look like now at, at a period where Egypt has actually uh, implemented maybe the, the highest level of crackdown on free speech and political activity in, uh, since 1952, since, uh, since the end of the monarchy? I mean, I think it really varies day to day. I mean, no one can understand, particularly people at Mada themselves have sometimes a hard time understanding how it is that they're still operating when some of these other organizations have either been forced to close or to move their offices elsewhere. So it's really changing day to day. There was a new law that um, sort of targeting digital media outlets that passed um, in December or the first of a series. Um, nothing, as far as I know, nothing has yet been happened with that, but we're moving into a presidential election cycle in Egypt where the crackdown has already begun on would-be um, presidential candidates and their parties, and so um, I think it's very much ongoing. Also, the biggest thing that has happened recently in, on uh, May 25th, um, a number of independent news outlets, Mada included, uh, sort of suddenly disappeared from the internet in Egypt. So if you go to their site and you're based and you're in Egypt, you won't find them. Um, but that, and so I think it's, um, it's a technology that's been used by the Chinese in, um, in their kind of very famously very effective firewall. Um, it's, and so, but Mada sort of immediately sprung into action. They continued to publish on their site for those of us readers who are outside of Egypt, and then they started publishing for an Egyptian audience on Facebook, on Google Drive, being more aggressive on social media. Um, and now, uh, as I understand it, it is intermittently available, but it still um, cannot be easily accessed in, in Egypt. So a different, uh, a different form of, of citizen initiative that challenges power is the coalition that you wrote about SEMA, uh, which over quite a long period of time and somewhat fruitlessly fought to 
uh, change the, the state of affairs here. Tell us what, um, what this coalition tried to do and what, and what, what happened. Okay. Um, so at the beginning, I mean, I'm sure whoever lives in Lebanon or reads about Lebanon knows that there's a saying that says, where is the state in Lebanon? But also there's something said that um, Lebanon is a country with a weak state but a strong civil society. And um, what I was wondering is why is it that this group of women's advocacy organizations that led uh, what is known as the Nationality Law Campaign, which in Arabic is called Jinsiyati, if anyone has heard of it, how, why is it that despite all their formidable efforts um, and all their work for around 13 years, why is it that eventually in 2012, when they got the chance to amend that law, um, it failed? They didn't fail, but it failed. And I mean, what essentially it was, was that the Nationality Law Campaign was a campaign that started in the early 2000s by, it was spearheaded by an organization called CRTDA, which is the Center for Research, Training, Development, Action. And what, it, what CRTDA sort of functioned under as the representative of that campaign, but doesn't speak in the name of its own organization, was a number of advocacy organizations called the Lebanese Women's Network, around 13, I suppose. Um, and the Lebanese Women's Network wanted, what they wanted to do is that they wanted to engage in reform politics, as in they wanted to engage with the state um, and to be inside of the state so that they can produce change. And what that meant was that, so they had a meeting in the early 2000s and they decided that to work on a case-by-case -case basis, to focus on very specific themes and specific issues and to take on one law and to work on it so that they can amend it eventually and then move on to other battles. Um, and what they decided was that it was time to actually speak about the nationality law because it concerns issues about citizenship. Now what happened was that in 2012, to cut the story brief to get to what happened eventually, in 2012 there was a ministerial committee that was formed by the Mi'ati government and to study that law, that was in March. And seven months after that, uh, the draft law, two draft amendments that were submitted were shut down because the state used the higher interest of the state, which is something you can't argue against, um, when they decided to not amend the law at all. Now that was their not, not their first attempt to amend the law, but that was like the, a very big blow to the, to the campaign itself. Um, and when I, when I talked to, to those that were involved in the campaign from, the, from start to, to the, well, up until today, what I realized was that there were two things that were very um, harmful to the campaign, and that was one which is quite uh, talked about a lot, which is the strategies of the sectarian elite in Lebanon, um, or the political class, how is it that they tend to halt political change, but I mean also the sectarian structure and like masculinist uh, structures of the state. But what I was very interested to find out was that these organizations, the advocacy organizations at some point, the alliances that they had formed fell apart. Um, they had at some point three campaigns running simultaneously because they had their own personal rivalries or differences of opinion, organizational principles that were different. So even if they had that same goal to change the nationality law, it wasn't the same path that they wanted to take eventually. And then I think that was very harmful to them, um, I mean, eventually. But what, also, what I also realized was that even though they hadn't amended that law, and even though they had faced so many challenges, both external and internal, both internally between themselves and externally from the state and conditions that were not within their control, especially like in 2012, there was the huge influx of Syrian refugees and that played a huge part in the amendment of that law, the lack of amendment. And what you realize eventually is that even if they didn't amend the law necessarily, what they did was that they shifted, they won, they, they initiated a debate about citizenship, women's citizenship in Lebanon and gender equality, but also they changed the discourse about the nationality campaign from one about naturalizing Palestinians or Syrians or anyone from, from an Arab country or foreign 
to one that is about citizenship, about women's inalienable right to have the right to give their nationality to their foreign husbands and children. And another thing, which the most interesting finding that I thought is why I say, why everyone asks where is the state, is by engaging with the state and having to be inside of the state to challenge it, having been called to meetings with the state, uh, sort of flagging the state for what it's not doing, for what it's supposed to do and how it's supposed to treat its citizens, was that they, I think they undid the, the black box that the Lebanese state is. It's very obscure to know, no one really understands how is it that the institutions of the Lebanese state work. Um, you have to actually get into them to understand what's going on on the inside. There's no manual that tells you what to do if you want it to change X. And what they did is that they really, by trial and error, uh, and by forming so many networks and alliances, you get to learn from them that they taught uh, so many civil society organizations that we see today about how the state functions and how you should press it when you need to. So if it Right, I mean, in the, the, the story you tell in, in your writing is of uh, a space where when, when CRTDA took, took shape, there were all these astroturf, ersatz, sort of fake women's organizations that were, uh, the, my words, not yours, you know, the prime minister's wife and the president's wife and the speaker of parliament's wife on a commission for women that was whose main purpose was many things, but not, none of which were to be fierce advocates for women's rights in contradiction to government policy. Uh, and so if, uh, uh, if you're looking for positive lessons to draw from, from the course of, of this quest, uh, I mean, do you believe that, that, what, um, uh, that what, the, what CRTDA did uh, in terms of playing insider politics rather than outside protest pressure politics and what they did in terms of trying to have a sustained lobbying campaign rather than a campaign of criticism. Did that actually, was that as, as, as radical a break with uh, civil society transition at the time, uh, a tradition at the time? And has it proven to be an effective model for anyone or anything uh, in, in the space uh, sense. Okay. I mean, I wouldn't say it was a break from the way, the way civil society organizations or particularly advocacy organizations had been developing at the time because that was when early 2000s, like late 1990s, these organizations were becoming more professionalized. They were turning into more of an NGO form. And it was the only thing that was very particular about the women's advocacy organizations, which a lot of other organizations followed suit with that, was they, they did not just play insider politics and not do protests, but they sort of did everything all at once in some way, which is they would challenge the state, they would do outside protests, but at the same time they would have negotiations with certain politicians, but they would also provide services for women that are facing difficulties with the state. They would help them in their dealings with the state. Um, so I think it was part of a trend, of course. Um, but what, what was very particular about this campaign, which I think is a, f is, is a model that is a blueprint, yes, that you can take on today and say that, yes, it is ha it's being replicated and developed, um, is because they formed certain alliances with the media, they formed alliances with the judiciary, um, especially the legal agenda, if anyone has heard of it. And what they did is that they brought to the fore so many various networks of activism that don't necessarily only deal with women's rights and gender equality, but that in some way form like a countercultural movement um, that would sort of aid that campaign from very different aspects, both from institutions that belong to the state and that would challenge the state and from those that are from the outside. I mean, the, the, the most depressing thing I take from your work on this is that you have this very sustained, very uh, well thought out effort to change the discourse, as you said, and say, hey, this isn't about your fear of Palestinians or now your fear of Syrian refugees. It's about a basic right, which is, 
the right of a Lebanese woman citizen to have the same rights as a Lebanese male citizen. And that really tr trumps and, and, and well, I shouldn't use the word, transcends any, uh, you know, any other consideration. And the response effectively is, yeah, but all these Syrians are here, so sorry, we can't talk about this now. And it, it, it was striking to me to be rereading your, your chapter last week and seeing this story in the Daily Star in, in which the Lebanese foreign ministry is still unable to strike this illegal and sexist regulation by which married women aren't allowed to apply for senior foreign ministry posts. And this is a holdover from some, uh, I, I forget from when. 17. Okay, so it's a holdover from 1970, and it's now apparently illegal under Lebanese law, but there it is, and somehow the foreign minister couldn't muster the, 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 the process or the juice to cancel this this abominable, you know, minor transgression compared to the citizenship one. But, you know, here we are how many years after CRTDA started its campaign and the actual status of women before the law remains awfully, awfully compromised. I mean, that's, that was one of the sad conclusions that, I mean, when I was hearing the activists tell their story, that was one of the most, like, it hurt me to actually hear what their account of that was. As in, the, like, one of the activists would tell me, I really thought the change could happen, like, in my lifetime. Um, but I think what is, what is important to know is that it's very, to have the state use the higher interests of the state that tells you something about how is it that the like what strategies the elite the like sectarian elite in Lebanon usually use is that the security card is a very powerful card. So whenever like the, there's an influx of Syrian refugees, oh security is more important, so women are not a priority at the moment. Um, and for example, the foreign ministry they have this habit of stalling. So the foreign minister at the time he said. Oh, two years ago, I said I would change that law, but then it just things happened and we forgot, and now women still can't apply to positions because they're married. Um, so I think what they do is that they they always say that this issue is not a priority right now. We're facing like way more serious issues, but the thing is that Lebanon has been facing way more serious issues for as long as I can and anyone can remember. So. So, so we're so we we're all uh, grappling with different uh, uh, permutations of civil society groups, citizen groups that are trying to fill roles that actually, in a healthy polity, would be filled by the state or, at, at worst, by political parties. So, basic questions of lit litigating citizenship, of of uh, documenting torture or stopping police abuse of power or uh, uh, chronicling the illegal transfer of power from an elected president to a military dictator. Uh, these, these, are, these are things that shouldn't be solely the role of, of small, uh, underfunded, uh, marginal citizen, citizen groups, but that more or less is a state of play across this region by design uh, of the regimes. So one running theme that, that we see in all these uh, uh, works that we, that, that, that we sitting on the stage have done and also a lot of the uh, research in this project uh, is first that the problem starts not with what civil society does or doesn't do, but with what states do to make sure that space doesn't exist. So there is, whether you're looking at efforts to crush Mada Masr and other similar uh, uh, initiatives in Egypt, whether you're looking at um, the, the campaign for, for women's uh, equal citizenship rights, whether you're looking, as I did, at the efforts of first you stink and then Beirut Medinati to pose some kind of meaningful challenge uh, to the Lebanese uh, sectarian kleptocracy, in all these cases, uh, we, we can and will up here point fingers at the shortcomings of these initiatives. But before we do that, we have to be very clear-headed about chronicling and appreciating the colossal amount of resources and intention mobilized by states to foreclose anything meaningful coming from any of these spaces. So 
the Egyptians see a local, uh, see a media sphere taking place after 2011, and they immediately start buying equipment from China and the United States and other places to uh, acquire the capability to shut down the internet, and lo and behold, six years later, we see that they can do a, a targeted uh, uh, ISP injection and block uh, 40 or 50 news sites the day before the controversial handover of Tehran and Sanafir to Saudi Arabia, and then they can, you know, open the spigot back up two days later. So that's one of one of many examples in the news right now, but they happen every week of the care taken to smother uh, to smother alternatives. Um, now that said, uh, these alternative efforts have persisted with a great deal of resilience and and. Uh, uh, an imagination and persistence, and, and despite a great personal toll uh, further, further um, uh, for the activists involved in them. When, uh, when you look at the uh, almost four years now that Madame Master has been publishing, what, what would you say are, are, are the ways in which they've actually had, um, had an impact on power or on political life in Egypt? Um, and would you would you say that they're effectively playing the role that in a in a in an open polity would be filled by the political opposition? And I realize that's a loaded question in an era where President Trump has defined uh, uh, the media as the opposition, and where people do can and do go to jail for for practicing uh, journalism. But still. Yeah, I think, yes, the backdrop to all this is that there are, uh, I believe, it, as of December, 25 journalists detained in Egypt. So Madamoth is doing everything they're doing in this sort of, in this environment of, you know, of a lot of fear and a lot of, and I think part of one of the, one of the tough things about being sort of allowed to operate is that there's always this fear that, well, are the security forces going to be knock at your door the next day, and this sort of, this, this struggle to not self-censor, um, which they really don't. I mean, the only sort of minimal amounts of, I don't think you'd even, I wouldn't even call it self-censorship, they've done this to maybe have a less sensational headline, but um, they really, um, and they say that it's much easier to make those decisions as a collective, so they really rely on each other to, um, to do that. Uh, I think, I mean, I think in Egypt, at a certain point, the at least working for an international news outlet there, um, what constituted news after you know almost a thousand Egyptian citizens were killed in one day in downtown Cairo? I mean, the threshold after you know hundreds of people were sent to death in mass trials um, for an international audience, it, you know, you you say you say to an editor, well, 300 more people were sentenced to death in one mass trial. They said, oh, well, it was 500 two weeks ago, so I don't know if that's really, if we can write about that. Whereas Mada has been incredibly sort of consistent and persistent in reporting every abuse, in reporting, in really kind of digging into um, to all of these issues on it. And week in, week out, um, they, 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 um, they document it. And it, it, it is, and it's serving a news function, but also I think they see themselves as very much kind of serving as an archive and documenting this period is something that can people can go back to and to, and, and, in, and in a in a time and culture of pronounced xenophobia, right, and paranoia about foreign hands and foreigners, uh, what are the implications of of the the fact that uh, the the decision of Mata to launch in English? What are the uh, why did they launch then an, an Arabic site and how did that if, if it all change or affect their role? Like what, what are they in English? What are they in, in Arabic? And who, who are their readers? Yeah. Um, well, one of the major implications um, is that MADA, like many other groups in Egypt, has at different times sought funding from, you know, grant funding and this sort of thing. And that makes it very difficult. I mean, and in this climate where you can be prosecuted for doing things like that, that makes sort of, even staying afloat, um, very challenging for them. Um, they, when Mada started out, it was very much a it was sort of a left-leaning group of journalists who were speaking 
I think to each other and to the sort of revolutionary youth generation, but also speaking to a foreign audi audience and, um, and explaining Egypt, I mean, it was Egypt also explained by the authors of this revolution to, um, to readers outside of Egypt. Um, I think as the spaces in Egypt where freedom of expression is practiced kind of shrink, is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking, they are, um, they, they are getting a, a wider audience, particularly in Arabic, on the Arabic site. I mean, I think, um, I think as the crackdown intensified, they very much wanted to speak to Egyptians about this happening. And one journalist said to me, you know, when uh, Ala Abdel Fattah, you know, writes his letters from prison, it's appropriate that we put them out in Arabic. And okay, English, you know, it's great. It's great that the national, international audience reads that too, but we want, you know, we want to be communicating to directly to the Egyptian population. And I think as, um, and so there are more and more Egyptian readers who don't necessarily share the political orientations of, um, of the, the Mada's co-founders, but you know, just are looking for any a source, an independent source of information. There are very few. A common theme and shortcoming that I've observed in civil society groups, activists, collectives, uh, uh, initiatives, even revolutionary uh, movements in the post-2010 Arab world is a real reluctance to openly seek power and to openly challenge power. Uh, the, the, I mean, in the, in the peak years of the Egyptian revolution, it was a common, a common theme of activists uh, or revolutionaries to say, we don't want chairs, we're just here to open the way for others who are, who are politicians, we're not politicians, and in the end, politicians and ultimately the military kept power and, and, and I would argue never actually lost it, uh, in part because of the hesitance of, of uh, challengers to say, yes, we want power and it doesn't matter if we're not professionals, you guys have made a mess and let, let's at least make our own mess and maybe we'll do a better job. Uh, definitely in the, uh, in the you stink in Beirut Medinati campaigns here, there was uh, a kind of allergy to politics and, and ideology. So at any point when criticizing, uh, criticizing the regime here uh, or, the, or the power structure here sounded too political uh, or, or risked having an ideological hue, be it socialist, neoliberal, capitalist, anything that, that had an identifiable characteristic, the, the group really carefully pulled back and presented an anodyne, power-averse, neutral reformist message. Uh, I think that is, uh, that is a widespread uh, uh, and, and, and restricting uh, boundary condition on this kind of, of civil society initiative. Uh, because if you're not admitting that you're a political party or movement, or you're not admitting that what you want is to have power, the power to change the laws, at the end uh, of, of, of the day, you're, you're stuck on the outside looking in, and you're uh, always subject to criticism. If you've said, if you've agreed that wanting power is wrong, then the second you look like you're, you're trying to affect power, they say, what, what are you, what are you looking for chairs? You're looking for chairs? Say, no, no, of course not. And then you're, you're essentially sidelined, uh, you know, like mansplained out of the conversation by the, by the, the guys who run things. Um, so in, w when you look at, um, at the, the course of, uh, of the, CRTDA and its uh, uh, related movements, do you feel like they, well, how did they deal with that trap? Um, and, and did they find a way to talk about uh, challenging power uh, that, that protected them from this kind of, from this kind of uh, 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 let's say, um, marginalization? I mean, the way that they dealt, I mean, they didn't necessarily 
their initial goal was not to actually be in positions of power. But I think the way that they dealt with they, when they realized that trap was like when in 2012, the ministerial committee had taken its decision to not amend the law, even though they thought they had been on the track because during that period they, would invi they were invited three times to come and discuss with that ministerial committee uh, to see what conditions could apply if you were to amend the law and why and everything. So they felt that they were involved in governance at some point. But then eventually the committee passed the law to not amend it without even telling them unless until they found out because it was leaked because that they can do that they can postpone telling anyone for a month that's actually legal um, and what they realized I think up uh, like at that point was that if they hadn't if they they're not in positions of like powerful political decision making positions then they wouldn't necessarily be able to set the terms themselves um, they did have they did have a chance. They tried to get into government, but but through an organization, I mean through a committee known as the National Council for Lebanese Women, which is a, it's a state it's a state uh, agency that deals with women's affairs. But the thing is, is that you had mentioned that earlier. So the president of that of that organization is the wife of the president, and the vice presidents are the wives of the Speaker of Parliament and of the Prime Minister. So even when they were talking to that, even when they were, they still do coordinate with that commission. But the problem with the commission, and this is, this is something one of the heads of the organization said to me, is that they represent the state for, they represent the state when they're talking to women's organizations and they don't represent women's rights when they go to the state. Um, and I think, the the commission the national i mean they do have an office and everything i visited and i but what they do is that they release reports they don't they don't act with these other advocacy organizations that operate on the outside they just coordinate and i the, i mean a lot of activists did say that was a gap and that's why today you hear so much talk about the quota and the and the electoral law and that's why there was so much talk about it and criticism and so one of the, I mean, one of the, one of the real, uh, one of the things that really slows down challenges to the system is uh, the difficulty that critics have of being baldly critical and, and openly political. So to talk in the, in the context of citizenship about the racism and the racist attitudes about Palestinians and Syrians that underlie the decision to disenfranchise all women in Lebanon. So basically to, to say, well, you're, you're choosing to prioritize your racism against these two uh, Arab nationalities uh, over your supposed lack of misogyny or, or sexism. Um, and uh, uh, in, um, in Egypt as well, we see, I mean, this is it's a slightly different context, but there, there are equally shibboleths that no one will talk about, like military torture uh, and, and uh, abuse of power, which MADA interestingly has trans transgressed uh, that, that uh, red line. Um, I think that um, one of the, uh, is, Maha, are you, in, are you in here? Maha? She's not in here, okay, because I wanted to bring Maha into the conversation uh, because of a paper she just uh, published uh, that looks at citizens' movements in Lebanon and Iraq. Um, uh, what I was gonna say is that uh, the, the, one of the central features of, of all this is, uh, is violence by the state against civil society, um, and we talk a lot about these Things in these anod using anodyne terms like red lines and uh, uh, you know uh, lobbying, organizing, activism, but often what we're really talking about is uh, the state being ready to lock up or torture or kill uh, people who appear ready to effectively uh, question uh, the state's monopoly over the narrative of what it's doing, um, and it really is. Uh, 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 amazing when you look at, at some of these cases, you know, CRTDA or, or Madame Masser or, uh, you know, other online activists who are essentially doing 
nothing more than publishing reports that, uh, that show that the state is lying. That alone is such a threat that the state will actually take a lot of trouble to lock up, harass, silence, uh, drive out of their jobs and otherwise uh, 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 quell this space. And uh, to me, it's sort of a, uh, like I wouldn't argue that civil society is strong enough to challenge, the, challenge these governments, but on the other hand, it says something about how uh, both violent and fragile their, um, their position is, that these marginal narrative challenges are, are such a threat. Uh, I'd like to invite you guys into, uh, you, you folks, into the uh, conversation. So there is someone, yes, who's going to take this mic around. Um, uh, Lily, why don't you come up and, and do the mic? If the, um, so what I want to do is have uh, uh, three questions, and then we'll answer them in a batch, and then we'll take another batch. Um, so why don't we do a, a trio of questions in the front, uh, the gentleman with the headphones, uh, Salma, and the gentleman next to her. Oh, you didn't have a question? Okay. Well, then uh, you trio, and then we'll take another, another batch. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Good evening. Muhammad, I, uh, I have a PhD in political science. Four or five years ago, a researcher was hosted by a Carnegie. His name was uh, Hossam Yafi. He's a Lebanese, and he holds uh, an American, the American nationality. And at the time, he had similar issues, and he talked about similar things as the ones that you tackle. He even said that one of the causes uh, behind the Arab Spring and the outcomes of the Arab Spring were related directly or indirectly to what happened in Iraq with the democratization in 2003, the elections, uh, the constitution which was uh, drafted, and all these concepts were not known by most Arab countries. Therefore, the Arab Spring countries such as Tunisia, Egypt, uh, Yemen, and uh, Syria So the Arab Spring countries, I think that they were not able to understand or assimilate democracy and participation. Democracy did not come uh, gradually in these countries. They, ca they came, uh, democracy came in one time, therefore those countries became failed countries. Do you agree with me? Thanks. Let's, uh, let's take two more questions. Uh, the gentleman right in front, please. Thank you. Yahya Hakim, uh, researcher with Transparency International. I would like to ask Ms. Seema, with regard the civil society in Lebanon, did you find something that can be called an awareness of the legislation of the Lebanese government from their knowledge, whether it is for citizenship, or whether it is for uh, the women's right, or all these different issues that today are still hot and are still being debated. But unfortunately, most of the time, the problem we are facing is that the civil society is not able to face the government circles and the government institutions because they lack the knowledge of the basic rules and legislative uh, basics. For instance, when we, when we talk about the electoral law today, see the confusion 
that led to what is today the situation. They voted a, a, a law, and now they are talking about amending certain parts of it. So this is the government. The Thank civil society did not even re react and to did this. Do you have a question? So this is something that I would like you to ask to see. Time. How did you find the preparedness of the civil society to challenge the government, different legislative efforts to really uh, do what it's not supposed to do, and it is doing it despite everything? Great question. Thank you. And uh, the gentleman behind you, and then we'll, and then we'll take that first batch. I have a, a PhD in political sciences in uh, Iraq. Some of the regimes which uh, witnessed change after the Arab Spring tried to use uh, the laws and regulations in order to restrict uh, freedoms, especially against the categories of society who were claiming change and who wanted to uh, reach some objectives behind this uh, uh, claim for change. And in the countries where we uh, had revolutions, uh, the revolutions were not up to the ambitions because of uh, corruption and because of the lack of experience of uh, the regimes there. Therefore, the laws were used in order to restrict freedoms or in order to um, uh, stop the ambitions of those categories who wanted to uh, have change. Therefore, some categories were exploited and they were also misled in order for the regime to make them believe then that they are the best option. So my question is the following. Could the media play a role in raising uh, awareness of uh, society and show society that they could induce change. Thank you. Thank you for those great questions. Um, do you want to start, Laura? Um, I, I can, sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> thanks. Um, I'll yeah, start with the, the most recent end of the last question about the role of the media in raising um, awareness of um, in raising the awareness of the um, the citizenry, and I think in the case of Egypt, where a lot of the media is state controlled, and the media that is privately controlled is run by bis businessmen, bis bis businessmen who often share, have interests in supporting the government line, or and even then to get a license to do broadcast media, you need to go through this. Do you have to be approved by the state? There is very, there is very little in, in sort of, well, another, another, another um, forgive me, important question of this, in this issue is class. So low-income Egyptians tend to get their um, media through, you know, state television sort of thing. And so, or outlets like Mada, or there are others. Mada is not the only one. Um, outlets like Mada don't. Often, it's difficult for them to to get the the readership that you know the state channels do, that um, the private the privately run broadcasters do. Um, so I think it's a question of access to readership. And as long as you know internet, I mean Mada is an internet publication. As long as internet penetration is as low as it is, and as long as the barriers to um, for a group like Mada to, to, for example, be on, have a television channel, as long as those those are what they are, which is um, incredibly difficult. I think it. I think groups like Mada trying to have an alternative narrative are pretty. Um, I think the challenges are huge. I mean, there's there's something uh, uh, a, a radical achievement of Mada Masa, which makes it, in my view, really unique in the region, is that they've provided a model that other media outlets can copy. So they are locally generated without some huge investor, without a bunch of foreigners coming in and, and setting them up. They set themselves up. They, make, they generate their own funding, which is small but sufficient. And then they've taken on real taboo topics and done them well. Uh, and I cited Hossam Bagat's uh, reports, but they've also, in, in cases like when there's a when there's a crackdown on 
on uh, Brotherhood supporters or when there's a crackdown on, on secular liberal activists, they chronicle this uh, in a way that um, all of us, not just Arab media, any media can look at and learn from. And that is, that's, you know, it's a limited maybe achievement. It doesn't, it doesn't change the way Jazeera covers stories. It doesn't change the way satellite TV operates. On the other hand, it gives journalists covering this region a, a model of how to do it. Also, critically, it puts information out there in a, in a place. Uh, so you might, have, you might have a Human Rights Watch report that says uh, security services in pick your country from the region, torture people this way and that way, and we might all believe it's true, but locally people will say, oh, it's Human Rights Watch, who cares? It's this American organization. If you have a group of Arab journalists writing in Arabic, using their own sources, and chronicling systemic abuse, torture, uh, criminality, mafia uh, operations run by the state army or others, uh, without overstating the impact of that, that is, that, that can be the building block five years from now of someone's political movement, for example, uh, or of someone's bill of particulars against, uh, against a corrupt ruler. Uh, so this is both the, you know, a really important achievement and also one that is limited. Uh, Seema. Yeah. Um, first, thank you for your question. It's one of the things that I had to really make sense of while I was doing my research and, I mean, in, in all the research that I've been doing on Lebanon. Um, I mean, what... Um, the, this is a very huge gap because it's so when I was trying to understand the nationality law myself, because the laws are written in a way that is so contradictory um, and they, you don't know what time they're going to pick one of their tricks and just shut you down and you're going to be, I didn't know that this trick existed until they do it. Um, and the thing, what was very special about the nationality law campaign was that they revealed a certain part of civil society movements by coordinating with the legal agenda at the time when they did in 2009, if you remember, there was the Samira Swaidin case. And that was one of the first times that they, you really, I mean, that's what the legal agenda had told me when I spoke to them, that it was one of the first times that they started using this technique of strategic litigation where it's not only the lawyer that can come and talk about legal issues, but it is anyone that can become acquainted with the legal system to understand how is it that it functions. And what they do to, to help, to help like, everybody understand how it functions, because it is very complicated, even to me, um, is that they would take individual cases, but individual cases that would highlight a social conflict. So they would use that case and they would run it through, and through that case you would start understanding how the judicial system works through using like cause lawyers, that, the way that legal agenda does. But another thing is that CRTDA, it's CRTDA was aware of, the first thing before they even launched their campaign, the first thing they did in 2002, Ziad Baroud, uh, they, did a, they did a report in Ziad Baroud in 2002-2003, which was explaining the law. It was only explaining the many different facets of that law. Because they themselves, and it was written first in Arabic, they themselves needed to understand why is it that it's, where should I amend it from? Um, what kind of amendments should I submit at this time? Should I exclude this? Should I exclude that? Now that's for them understanding that this was a gap. Um, what, uh, where I think this is still a gap today is because really the sectarian elite, the sectarian political class in Lebanon are very sneaky in the way they can do these things. So one of the activists, she would, she, the coordinator, the initial coordinator of the campaign in the early 2000s, she said, Ziad Baroud, when he was Minister of Interior, he submitted two draft laws, two amendments to the draft law. And we realized that the ministry, when they saw that he submitted two, because we were afraid that they were going to say, no, this won't work for us. So there was one with exclusion of husbands and one without exclusion of husbands. And they said, oh, no, we don't accept if you give us two amendments to the law. And they just shut him down. And like, we didn't know that. And another, like, one last example, I promise, um, was, for example, during the Sanyura government, they submitted a draft law that, I mean, that was not CRC RTDA that submitted it, that was the NCLW, that was with exclusion of Palestinian husbands specifically. 
And what Sanyura said, oh, if I were to amend that law, it would be without exclusion. So I will not amend it. So at some point, and these are real tricks that they can play on you. And this is where, you know, like, even if I understand this judicial system and this, the, the legal, how everything legally does work, and like, it, it really keeps you wondering. But I mean, I know that they are very much, and now more than ever, aware of this fact. Um, so, yeah. so let's take another round of questions. Uh, let's, we got Mona, uh, what's the judge? Ali in the front and Anne. Uh, let's, do those, let's do those three and then we'll see if we can get one more round. Uh, my question is to Sima. Um, I'm really interested actually in what you said about how women actually represented the government and not uh, the women who are working in uh, these NGOs who are, representing, who are were married to politicians were representing the governments and not these NGOs. And did you look into the social angle? Because I've done some work on women and what the primary enforces enforcers of misogyny in Lebanon are women, their mothers, their wives. These are the enforcers of misogyny. So can you, like, have you looked into that angle and maybe into the awareness or awareness campaigns that could be done to, to change this trend? Thanks. Ali. Uh, thank you. Um, my name is Ali al a former Bahraini MB. My question is to Laura. It's with regards to the media and effect of the media with regards to supporting the civil societies. I mean, like a couple of years ago, we've had a project, um, we've seen a project being sponsored by US governments with the Democrats, not with the Trump uh, government uh, now. Uh, it was uh, supporting the civil societies, uh, enhancing their projects, um, basically there was a project based in uh, Bahrain and uh, basically in Kuwait, Morocco, Jordan, uh, countries like that. But um, later on, like a few years later, the, the GCC governments, they realized this project is not in their favor. This project is uh, enhancing the activists, politicians, uh, human rights defenders and women and young well, everyone, and they think this is not something that they like to see in, in their countries. Um, when 2010 movements started in Tunisia and then followed by Egypt and Bahrain, Libya, Syria, and other countries, we've seen um, a very, very aggressive uh, action uh, being taken by these governments, and they were calling back uh, that program supported by the American, as they said, well, what is, whether, it is, what, whether it was in Egypt or in Bahrain, the same, the same thing. Uh, now we don't see civil societies, we don't see any programs. Uh, well, these campaigns, which was just mentioned by Sima here, it's fantastic. It's always been followed by a program that people in, in our countries, like in the GCC countries, they like to either to, to copy or to, you know, to take the ideas like you know of, of these campaigns which they are not allowed now do you think the media play this role can bring back um, the support to these young to the young to the new generation not to give up even though they are marginalized now even though they are not allowed to do anything there is uh, in Bahrain in my country where the government is stripping the nationalities where the people wants to launch a campaign, jinsiyati haqqi, they are not allowed. Uh, women, they are not allowed. Anything, it's not, it goes to politics. Anything, it's enhanced the opposition part. It's not allowed. Anything towards the government, sponsored by the government. Well, this is another issue. These Arab governments, the dictatorships, they would like to fund and sponsor civil societies, but subject to play the role in their favor only. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great question. Uh, and Anne, please. Maybe in the spirit of the projects aimed to focus on the granular, and maybe because I'm a journalist, I have some very granular questions about Madame Masser. Um, <laughs> How many people are involved? How big is their newsroom, so to speak? How much output do they produce weekly or daily or whatever the relevant 
measure would be. And, um, and then I would just like to know the mechanism of really how they continue to put this stuff out. It, it, as you mentioned, it's remarkable that they still do it, that, that they're publishing this material and not being arrested or, or threatened or shut down. So how, um, can you give some examples of were there threats that were delivered and deflected? You know, can you give some examples of how they've negotiated that, that boundary line and, and how they managed to cross it? Thank you. Uh, this time let's start with Seema. Um, Muna, right? Yeah. Um, Muna, I mean, I, this was, I mean, a lingering question in my head, but the issue is it, with it is that I didn't, like, there's so much, res there isn't, I mean, I, there, I mean, there isn't much research about, not that women are in a traditional role, but that what they do is that, and there's a very famous researcher called Sua Joseph that has written extensively about that, where she argues that women are more attached to kinship forms of association or family or even sect than they are to a more woman um, uh, women oriented citizenship understanding of their position in society. And I think that has to do with two things. One of it is depending on what what kind of environment that you live in but and I can't say much more than that I think this is something that should definitely be way f more invest further investigated because it is one of the most pressing issues that people say women in a working women for working class women or women that don't live in cities or that live in rural areas are not uh, are not as aware of these campaigns and of their whereabouts as much as uh, as much as women inside of Beirut or um, in other areas and but as far as uh, as far as my research was concerned that the sectarian system sometimes itself um, encourages you to forget that this is a woman's issue or that this is a citizenship issue because what happened throughout the CRTDA campaign was that uh, the Samira Swaiden 2009 issue, the people who had overturned uh, this decision were three women judges. And what happens is that you, when you get into to understand how is it the judicial, the judicial system works, you understand that to get promoted or to get moved from one uh, court to another, that depends on what the politicians would want because they have a role in it. So at some point, even if you were even if you had wanted to make some form of change, even if that wasn't, even if you believe that nationality should be given to women, this, the structure of the system, its patronage networks, the, the clientelism and all that really factor into if you were to defend women's rights or not sometimes. But the question on like association, traditional roles of women, kinship ties, that's something I think is, should definitely, definitely be investigated a lot more in Lebanon. your Bahrain question first. Um, I think, I mean, what we see in Egypt is that, you know, yes, you have Mada doing this, but, um, you know, bravely kind of struggling on every day, and you have other, you know, small online media outlets. But I think one of the biggest places where you see these debates and even sharing of news, sharing what's going on, is, is actually on Facebook and on WhatsApp groups, Skype groups, and I think it's taken on, at least in the Egyptian context, something that is sort of beyond how people out in, in countries with, that have more normal media spheres um, engage with it. I mean, people have whole long political discussions, kind of talk, people talk about what's going on in their particular community, you know, because you can be in Minya or you can be in Sinai and you can log onto Facebook and say, this is what I saw, this is what's happening, and you can access networks in Cairo or Alexandria. Um, and so I think we shouldn't discount, say, oh, it's just social media. It, I think it has become almost a part of the media mainstream. I think Bahrain, um, just. Yeah. Um, and also Bahrain has a particular problem of being so, it's very close to my heart. I spent a lot of time in Bahrain. Um, and, but they have a particular issue, which is that it's, it's so small. It's very difficult to be anonymous. It's very difficult to, you know, and so I think that's a, um, a problem that's very specific. You know, Cairo is 20 million people, and it's not that, I mean, they know where Madame Masraf is, of course, it's not that, that is anonymous, 
but um, you know, it's harder to, I mean, it is very monitored, but it's harder to do that one in a. Well, they get help, but they don't do it. They were different from international community to give them some devices to find out who is actually. Yeah. Who is who is all about. I mean, in one main part of Zamalek, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, you know. Uh, and we oh, excuse me. <laughs> and um, in terms of the news, Meta is growing quite rapidly. When they started, they were maybe 25, 20 uh, reporters, and then obviously other contributors. Um, but that includes also like the business team, which was the business team were all kind of reporters first that had like a smattering of business experience between them. Um, and I think now they're trying to have a, have people who are more devoted, you know, who have or have more of a business background and they're trying to, I, I think that the model of being a um, very collectivist newsroom is, I mean, is very much what they want, although at a certain point I think there has been a sense that perhaps it should be somewhat more structured and so they're trying to move towards that and I think they've hired many, well, there used to be many more reporters on the English side and now they're hiring many more on the Arabic side. Um, in terms of day to day, output. Um, I actually don't know the answer to that, and sorry, but I can um, come back to you on it. But in terms of is kind of getting around the state, um, that's kind of an interesting question. I mean, Mada, the first thing was Mada's legal status. Mada, Mada is an LLC, um, and so they, they actually are a legally registered organization, which is very important in Egypt, because otherwise you could just be, you know, completely um, shut down, but the reporters themselves don't actually have press cards, which didn't used to be an issue until 2013, um, because they're not part of the syndicate, and so it's very, but there's also much less street reporting in Egypt than there used to be. I mean, journalists, I mean, there aren't any protests, but even at the end of the protests, most journalists I know were not going down to them because um, the risk of arrest and also risk of being shot, but the risk of arrest became um, very, very high, so it's, I mean, they continue to, they also do a lot of cultural <coughs> reporting and analysis, but to the extent that they are still going out and doing street reporting, like most journalists in Egypt, it's much more sort of in offices, in closed spaces. Um, you really don't want to kind of go do Vox Pops on the street because it's just not, um, particularly for Mata and their precarious status, um, it's much less safe. We can take two more quick questions. So uh, let's take the, the man with the goatee, the man with the tie, and Salma. But please make your questions super short if you can, OK? Hello. Hi. Uh, Abdesalam Sinnoum in the Center for Public Policy and Leadership, United Arab Emirates. Uh, the question, um, when you talk about research, what type of research are you talking about? What is the methodology? How can correspondent my research ablo? Well, uh, well, new? Is it? They will. How can I research a field study? Uh, research, for example, Lebanon is a can Lebanese. Did you prepare a field study in Lebanon, for example? Uh, did you ask the Lebanese uh, citizens uh, whether they advocate? Uh, for women to pass on their citizenship? You are maybe one of the only people with a tie, sir. Well, my, my question is very simple. How to have the pa uh, uh, how we will have uh, democracy in the Arab world. <laughs> well, the, the, answer, the answer which I have here and we have in general is to have free elections. And in order to have free elections, you have to have a good electoral law in order to enable you to move on to this direction. Here in Lebanon, we have spent about seven months, or even more than that, you know, w uh, yes, working on the electoral law. And at the end, we came with a law 
by which you know each clan in Lebanon, each political clan will be able to be represented adequately. Uh, this is not a law. Uh, this is not an electoral law. An electoral law would be to have the possibility for somebody not to know in advance if he will be elected or not. That's a great question. Thank yes. you. And, uh, yes. yes. That's why. That's why the the best law, to my knowledge, is the one man, one vote. You know? Time to answer. If you keep and the no, microphone, nobody, so please. Nobody would agree on that. I thank you. And uh, last uh, uh, question to Salma in the front row, and then we'll wrap up. Thank you. Uh, hi. Thank you. Um, my question is was um, related to the point that you had about taking power and the hesitance to take power. And, you know, when these movements are trying to challenge pow power, but also challenge the nature of power. And so taking that power seems like also, you know, it, it, it's a difficult thing. I mean, as a Syrian um, uh, activist working um, with NGOs, there's always the pressure. I mean, there there has been many youth that I've worked with who are, the word leadership, they will reject that. They do not want to be leaders because that word is, is you know, it, what leadership is in the Arab world is so negative and nobody wants it. So they won't even take that word, let alone other kinds of, and there's uh, also another pressure on civil society. Um, and and there, there you talk about NGOs in particular, but there's also this pressure from the international community or donors to be neutral, to not be associated with, opposition groups or polit opposition, you know, and, and so there's the, the, a double pressure to not be political or not be seen as taking power. I'm curious about uh, if you've seen examples where they've navigated this challenging the nature and, uh, of, the po of power and power and, and, and actually seeking or succeeding at taking any power. Great questions, thank you. So uh, these will also double as our closings. So we'll start with you and end with me, and that will be the end of panel one. Okay. Um, I think the, the question of democracy in the Middle East, I'm gonna leave that to wiser people than me because that's, um, but um, to the question of taking power, I think um, in the Egyptian context there has yeah, there was very much that hesitancy, but as the space has closed, I think there has been some, at least in the case of Mada, there's been some attempt to, I mean, it's not taking political power, but to just the sort of the very act of talking about government abuses I mean, is its own way of taking power, at least of the, or trying to take power <laughs> of the narrative, or at least assert a, um, a counter narrative. Um, in, there've also, I've also seen all, as human rights organizations have um, shut down, I've seen lawyers leave those human rights organizations and set up kind of cabinets by themselves and, start, and fight human rights cases, but as just uh, sort of under the guise of almost a more corporate cabinet. And actually that, there were a number of cases where that was successful and more on um, LGBTQ issues, less on kind of direct um, you know, democracy cases, but there people really are trying to sort of figure out what different mechanisms, how they can, I mean, maybe they don't call themselves a human rights organization, but how they can continue to do that um, work. And I think as there was more of, I think in the post-2011 period, there was a sense that there was a lot more time than ended up being to sort of figure out their structures and to have these conversations. And as it's felt like there's, that space is closing or almost has closed, you see people partly out of desperation and partly out of sense of nothing to lose, all sorts, for all sorts of reasons. Um, trying to challenge power more directly. But some might argue it's a bit late, but not, but uh, yeah. Um, okay, I'm gonna take the question about the field study, just because you, um, you asked about whose opinion and if I had asked someone's opinion about security slash uh, women's rights. Um, I mean, the research methodology that, um, that I used in my research, it was twofold. So first, um, and uh, being someone who had not uh, been a coordinator in that campaign, but rather just merely a protester who went to some of those protests, um, and at the time I was too young, um, but um, 
But what I did was, um, I did two things. First, I did my background research about the campaign, every single media report that was there, both in Arabic and English about it, to understand sort of from the, from the start, from the early, I mean, the campaign had started gaining media attention in 2007, 2008, and then going through all the court uh, documents about the case, about the uh, Samira Swaydin case, which was the court case, and then from then on, just to sort of do every single publication that CRTDA had done um, and all the other organizations that were part of that campaign that, and that had duplicated the campaign and the research studies that they released. But then afterwards, after doing that, of course, what it was is that it read like a story. So what you do is that you go to the people who had participated in that campaign, who had uh, either led it, uh, participated in the protests, written about it, uh, participated in helping Samira Swaydin, for example, um, so I talked to people from CRTDA, up, and you can scroll down to all the other acronyms of the organizations that are mentioned in my paper, um, and uh, people as well from the government representatives, uh, ministers who had been part of that campaign, um, people from Legal Agenda, um, the judge that was in charge of Samina Sleidane's case. So the thing is, is that what you, what you would do is that you would try to, as much as you can, create a holistic account of what had happened uh, throughout these 10 to 15 years um, and get it from the people who were part of it. So I spoke to th two coordinators of the same CRTDA campaign, one that had taken it at the start and then who had continued, when the, 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 the other women who had continued at the end of it. So you just, you literally you would trace it um, but and just put the pieces together and from there you would evaluate what had happened. And knowing that this is what, what the way that I think also a lot of the research that we had done actually went, was done was that you're not I'm not I'm not the one here saying women security doesn't matter and women's rights matters and that's it and I'm, this is this is the activists account of the story I'm telling their story and the way that they had seen it was that at the time the security card was used to shut down their project at, and many other projects at the same time when it wasn't really a security threat, when their project was not a security threat. Now, a lot of people definitely still do catch on to that discourse, that secure, of course, there is uh, teen refugees, Palestinians would be naturalized, but the thing is that, I mean, at least in my case, what the campaign did is that they, they shut down all these arguments because they were not true they revealed the numbers and the statistics that prove that this excuse was not right. It, it was just wasn't true. Um, so, I mean, I'm right. just gonna leave the last one, the big part, the Nazi. Ah, <laughs> democracy. Um, no, so, uh, <laughs> uh, I liked your methodology question because actually I think the most important thing about our project is the approach we've taken. And it is to say, there's a lot of bloviating and there's very little data, and I don't mean BS quantitative data that's fake surveys and numbers, I mean data that is what happened, what people say happened, what people saw, what people attempted, what people wrote. Uh, that, that living archive is very poorly gathered and maintained, uh, especially at this really pivotal moment of transmission and transformation, so having an account of Madame Masser's contemporary history or of CRTDA's efforts is actually in of itself a somewhat, uh, uh, I'd say a somewhat radical act. These things don't exist. I mean, I've been hearing about CRTDA for years. There's not even a magazine story written about, about this campaign. So unless you happen to know the people involved or happen to know the story because you lived here and followed it, you just won't really know what happened, which is absurd. So unless, crisis group happened to write a report about it or some other, you know, reliable, obscure NGO wrote a report about it somewhere along the line, it just, it's lost to history. Uh, and I think this is key to just creating uh, a, an unfolding record in political consciousness. Um, uh, I'll, I'll close by addressing uh, uh, the, 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 the last two questions together. Um, you know, that question of how do you bring democracy to the, to the Arab world um, and the question of are there examples of people actually standing up 
and saying, yes, I want power, give it to me, and here's what I'll do. Um, I, I, think, I think that's absolutely the, like the crux. So the moment we're in is one in which the, the system has failed. It's reached a breaking point. Even magnificent Lebanon is so dysfunctional that this, this, this gutted sectarian apparatus that will, will, will try to scare people to death rather than reform, even in the most tiny way, because no one wants to give up anything they're stealing, uh, uh, still is powerful enough that most challengers will not challenge the system. And Beirut Medinati, bless them, they're wonderful, fantastic, I admired them tremendously. They absolutely refused to criticize the system. They even absolutely refused to admit that what they want is power and that they're a political movement. And in the end, they opted not to register as a political party and contest national elections because they didn't want to look like they wanted power, which frankly is, it's absurd. It's absurd. Um, and so, so who has done that? Uh, I mean, some, uh, you know, the, the, you know some of the groups that have done that, and they're armed groups, right? So like, so the, the groups that have been willing to, to cross the Rubicon and contest power, uh, mo most of them not very appealing. Uh, I'm uh, looking for the Rubicon, what it is. Yeah, <laughs> and, uh, and so what you're left with in the nonviolent sphere um, I think you can find some intellectuals and some groups that in very limited, uh, in limited cases are willing to, uh, uh, to, to, to directly challenge power, but that is, um, it's a psychological condition. And I remember some, some of, um, I mean, I've now spent 15 years interviewing activist after activist in Iraq and Egypt and here and elsewhere in Syria, and they, uh, you know, we come back to this moment where they say, you know, politics is dirty. If I define myself as a politician, I shed all the credibility that I obtained from 10 years in prison, 15, you know, for all the things that I did, I will lose that if I say I'm a politician. And Changing that won't solve the problem, but if you don't change that, you don't have a chance. Um, so with that, uh, I will end our panel. Thank you very much for your time and attention. We're going to have a 10-minute break, and then we're going to start the next panel. Uh, thank you very much for coming and for staying with us.